How are you today? Rich Pepino, Executive Chef at Drexel University. I'm here today to talk to you about one of my favorite parts of eating, breakfast. I know everyone in the world today has their own opinions of what breakfast actually is. In some places like Japan, you might be eating fish for breakfast. If you were in France, you might just be getting a, a cafe and a croissant. But me being an American and me being someone who has loved breakfast foods from when he was young, I'm here today to try to show you a couple fun little things that you could do for a breakfast or a brunch, and it isn't that hard. So I hope that you come along with me today and enjoy a bunch of different and fun breakfast and brunch items. So today, I thought we'd start off with one of my favorite ways to start a breakfast or brunch off, and that is with either cured or smoked meat. So today, that brings us to us curing a little salmon. I am going to show you how to cure a Gravlox in a traditional manner. And when I'm doing this, uh, there are a lot of little variables I want to bring to your attention. Hopefully you like uh, cured fish for breakfast, whether it be with a bagel or a toast point or with some goat cheese perhaps or a little cream cheese. So I'm going to try my best to show you today how we can cure this beautiful piece of salmon. So the first thing I would like to bring to your attention is make sure you have fresh fish. Whenever you are working with any kind of fish and you're going to go smoke it or cure it, you want to be sure that the fish is at its peakness of freshness. So when we open this up and we're looking at our fish, you want to smell it. You want to make sure there's a nice sheen on top of it. So this would be the first thing you look at when choosing your fish. So we have a beautiful piece here. And from this point, you got to know your weight. So we're about to go into curing. With any kind of fish, when you're curing something, let's say between two and a half and three pounds, you're looking at, and in this situation, we're going to use salt and sugar. To cure something, you truly only need salt, but to emphasize different flavors and salmon is wonderful for doing this because of its high fatty content, its high fat content inside of it. Um, we're going to be bringing out some unique flavors inside of the salmon by using, today we're going to beet cure it. And with the beets, uh, you're also going to get this beautiful color on top where it almost will look like stained glass red going into orange. On top of the beets, we're also going to be using a little fresh dill, which is very classical in a gravlock, and then touch it with fennel pollen, white pepper, bay leaf, and we're going to wash it with Pernod so that anise flavor over time truly comes out inside of it. So this piece is around two and a half pounds. So I already have measured out around three-fourths a cup of sugar and three-fourths a cup of salt. Now, for different recipes, you can go different routes. I'd like to say if it was in the fall, maybe I might change my regular granulated sugar with brown sugar. Perhaps I would do a rub instead of Pernod, I would wipe it with rum and maybe add hints of flavor with allspice or star anise to give it more of that fall flavor feel to go along with another recipe. Who knows, anything from perhaps apple butter and chev to any other kind of complement of fall flavors. This is more traditional in a, let's say, Scandinavian slash French mentality. This is where we're going to be using this to emphasize the flavors of this season, which is a little lighter. The beet cure is more for the color. Yes, it will give earthy flavors to the fish, but uh, for the most part, this is also meant for the look. So you would have that beautiful red with the orange on the dish. So we have our beautiful piece of fish here. First thing I always will tell people is pat it down. You should always pat it down completely dry. You want it dry so that way when everything else is touching it and we wipe it with the salt, the sugar, and the pernil, that it is going to actually adhere to the top and to the bottom of this. So I'm even going to wipe the bottom of it and make sure the base is nice and dry. Now, when going for a cure, this cure in particular would go for around two to three days. 
I say two to three days based off of that extra half pound, three quarters of a pound. Like I said, this one will probably go between 48 and 52 hours based on it's a two and a half pounder. If you just raise it up by a little half pound, three quarters of a pound more, you might want to give it an extra day on cure. Why? Because the thick part of this, which is right here, you want to make sure that the salt, as it turns to brine, inside of here, that brine penetrates through here and also gives it the flavor as it penetrates that you're looking for in the graph line. So, we have a nice And we're going to use today a piece of tin foil. You could use, and I would also recommend possibly at home, using plastic wrap. Um, the idea of using this, we're going to retain the brine inside after the salt and the sugar excrete and start to cure the salmon liquid through the curing process is being released. So as that liquid is being released, as I said, that is what's going to also enhance the flavors inside of this graph line. So our next move is going to be, I'm going to actually start off with putting on the bottom of this some of my salt and sugar. That way it's going to slowly penetrate from the bottom part of this where my skin of the salmon is going to be. Use a little of this underneath. Now the meat of everything that I'm going to use is going to go on top of it directly. So I have a little salt and sugar in there. And from that point, I'm going to take this and lay it right down where I just salted it. So right here, boom. That's how we set it. Now at this stage, I'm going to start off and give it a little white first with my printer. Just a little pour right on top. Remember the fish is porous, this will seep. Room. Now, that's a little bit to begin. I probably just poured around a quarter of a cup on top of it. I have another quarter of a cup I'm going to pour on, but now I first would like to saturate it with salt. So as I said, it was three quarters of a cup of salt. Around a quarter of a cup I probably put on the bottom of it. And now the rest of it I'm putting on top, making sure I get it coated all over the top. Now I mix it up, go with my sugar. And I just reserved a little more salt to put on the very top after I get all of my other ingredients. I'm going to do the same thing with my sugar. So, right there, I have my salt and my sugar. And I'm going to pour a little more Cronel right on top. It's actually going to create almost a little paste from all of these, from the salt and sugar. It's going to make a little paste right on top. So it's going to help penetrate as it sits right there. Give it another little sprinkle of my salt. Still reserving just a little for the very end. And then a little more sugar. Now I have my salt and sugar and up all on top of my fish. My next move is going to be this little baby. Now remember, as I said, I'm creating a brine. That brine, a brine, by definition, is nothing more than liquid and salt, water and salt. And that salt is going to excrete the water from within this sand. So by doing this, I'm creating a natural brine the moisture of the sand. And all these flavors I'm about to put on here are going to help flavor that sand. So right there, I'm going to use a little bay leaf. One chef told me, always try to cook pretty. So right now, yes, even the way I'm going to lay this out, you always want your food to look good, even in the preparation stages. And always remember, right here now, just a little bit of white pepper. Now always be careful with white pepper, especially ground. White pepper can be very, very powerful. Some people abuse it. I've seen that at working in culinary schools and working around other individuals. Some people like to abuse white pepper. I am not one of those people. On the other hand, something as gentle as fennel pollen, I love because that little anise flavor, that's what I'm adding now, that little anise flavor is really going to give incredible compliment 
to that pronoun and to the salmon overall. Get that all over. Now, next phase. I'm going to take a little dill and shred a little dill all around this. You can use the stem, you can just lay it all around because this dill is going to help flavor this salmon as it's in the curing process. And dill naturally just goes so well with salmon, especially when it's cured. Uh, if you were to poach the salmon, I know a lot of people would see maybe a cold dill mayonnaise or sauce that would go with the salmon. Well, even with cured salmon, you can use that dill. Just taking a piece of the already cured salmon, add a creme fraiche and a piece of dill. It is classical and it is delicious and that will never change. From this point, I have my dill. Now last but not least, I'm gonna recommend for the final stage, use your gloves. And if you have gloves, I recommend it because I'm about to put beets on top of this fish. Red beets will sting, so always be careful. Right here, I'm going to shingle the beets all over the outside of the center. So that way it's completely coated by the beet. And as I was saying before, so as the brine is created from the stream liquids from inside the salmon, the liquid inside these beets and the brine itself is going to start to dye itself red. And that color, that beet red that can be so beautiful in certain dishes, is going to penetrate through the salmon and in the end it's going to slightly color the salmon halfway through or at least a third of the way through as it cures. So that way when you get to the finished product, the finished product will be beautiful. Whether you use it just on a breakfast bar or you're even making a mousse bouche or a little canopy little hors d'oeuvre if you would for your guests. So right here you can see I have shingled my beets all over top of this piece. From this point I'm going to then take a little bit of that salt that I rendered and saved, served it for that point because this salt and this little bit of sugar is going to start the maceration even within the beet. And by macerating those beets, it's the same thing as curing. You're going to be drawing the moisture from within there. And that moisture is going to help flavor and color this crab wine. So at that stage, we're going to take this nice and tight. I'm going to wrap it. So, Nice and tight, go all the way around, just like that. And I'm going to recommend you use two pieces. That way, that brine is stationary, it's in there, and you know it's not going to escape. Which is a very important part of this, if you'd like to get that color. Now, if you're worried, if you use tin foil, about it reacting within a 48 hour period, there will be no reaction with the salt and the tin foil. If you go over 72 hours, you might see a reaction with the salt and the tin foil. Which is why I also would say if you're going to do this at home, maybe you might want to try using plastic wrap, but that is only up to you. Tin foil. So you get to this stage, and what I will do now, I'm going to put this inside of a refrigerator. Turn it over so this side is now down. And I'm going to put around three to five pounds of weight right on top of this. That weight is going to ensure that that salt is going to help penetrate, excrete the liquid, and then create my brine. And then that way also it will toughen up the skin as it cures. And you want to make sure that it's all set and ready for at least 48 hours pressed down. Some people might even say you might want to rotate it after a 24 to 36 hour period to ensure that it gets brined the whole way So after that, here is what I'm going to show you. So I'm going to take this away. 
I'm going to show you a finished product of this one dish. Voila, the magic of tea bait. You then have a nice, beautifully cured gravlock. The gravlocks themselves. Beautiful color has come out. You have a nice dyed look of the red on top. You can even see if I cut all the way down here, based off of how long it is cured, whether it be a good 48 hours or 36 hours, you can just look right there and see how the color is penetrated through the actual skin. And what we're going to do with this grab box today. I'm going to be showing you how just a few pieces of these ground locks also will make a wonderful, wonderful addition to a classical French omelet with an herb chef. And that is going to be what we do in a minute. So with that, I'm just going to cut a couple pieces of ground block here so I have them all ready. And then from that point, we're going to take this, say bon appetit. So now you've seen how I've cured this. Uh, just to conclude, the way this should look after it does come off that cure and I take it out of that wrapper, the one thing I wanted you to know is when the salmon is done, you really would like to, if you have the extra time, to rinse everything off that salmon after it comes off the cure. And then, once you rinse it off, I preferably like to leave it out in the refrigerator unwrapped for around, if you can, six to 10 hours. So it actually develops a nice skin and it gets that nice chew and texture that you're actually looking for. So after you see this come out of your refrigerator and you have your grav locks all ready, I'm actually going to now show you how to use these grav locks and put them inside of an omelet. Now, I love eggs. Omelets, uh, I probably was like around 10, 11 years old when I transitioned from dippy eggs into an omelet. And once I learned how to make an omelet, I thought I was golden. But I then, through my travels, have now learned there are a lot of different definitions of what an omelet is. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. When we think of an omelet, in most situations, maybe you go to your local diner and you get a, an omelet and maybe sometimes it might come out square. If you see a square omelet, it was probably made on a flat top griddle where someone would then ladle their egg on the griddle and then put any item that they would have just cooked on the flat top right in that griddle, well, on that egg, and then they would fold it over and make a rectangle or a square and then just slide it on a plate. Usually a place that's going to do that is going to give you an orange wedge and a couple pieces of small fruit on the side of those home fries. But I'm going to also show you right now how to make a traditional French omelet and how to distinguish between a traditional French omelet and an omelet that you yourself at home might want to make. I know that not everyone is going to make something the same way and enjoy it the same way because everyone has their own likes and dislikes. So right now, I'm gonna show you the way I made that omelet the first time I learned to make it. So this is as simple as can be. In this one bowl, I have clarified butter. What's clarified butter? Clarified butter is butter that we have not removed the milk solids, impurities, and water content from it. By removing those three things, you now have your butter able except a higher smoking point. If I was to put right now in this hot pan a tab of whole butter, that butter is going to start to bubble and then it would brown really quickly. And in some situations, brown butter is delicious, especially if you're doing it with pasta. But in this situation, I want my butter clarified. That way, when it hits that pan, you can hear that sizzle, but it's not going to change its color. It's going to remain that nice bright yellow. 
I put around a tablespoon of butter in there. You could go a little bit less, a little bit more. If you have too much in, you could pour it right out. It really makes no difference. And at this stage, I'm gonna first show you that omelet that I would have made when I was 12. So I would not have done this in a traditional manner. What I would have done is probably lift it up underneath my egg and let the egg cook the whole way through and never thought about color or fluffiness. Now, let me just let you know, I'm cooking right now on low. I'm gonna raise my temp up just a little to get this moving a little faster. And I'm gonna just make sure all of those, all of that runny yolk gets cooked underneath. Now, one reason I love cooking an egg when I was younger is because then I learned how to flip an egg when I was younger, which was fun. And then, that traditional egg omelet that you would see, you would then see people put their cheese or other stuffings in here, take it out, put it over in a plate, and then fold it over like that. Now, that is probably what most of you think of when you see that omelet. Some of you might want to get it crispier. Some of you might want it even drier than that and get that color on the outside. That is a personal preference, and I am not a person to tell you what you like or dislike. But I'm a person who's going to show you another way to make this, and in my own opinion, how to make it better. So, I'm now going to make sure you also understand the size pan and the type of pan makes a big difference when you go into this. These are two identical pans, one's a six inch, What's an eight inch? I prefer to use the eight inch, but if you were making a very, very, very small omelet, you could go with this. But the one thing I want you to think about then is surface area, and also how many eggs are you going to use? For this ladle right here, this is around a two and a half to three egg omelet, just based off of six ounce. Now, with this, that might actually end up being a much thicker omelet. With this one, with what we're about to do, you're going to see that that two and a half to three egg omelet, that six ounces of eggs that have been whisked together, how it's going to actually form a beautiful, beautiful texture and to have a definition of what a French omelet is. Just to show you this one though, you can see how some pans lose their texture, their Teflon texture inside, eggs will stick. The better the Teflon or the better the non-stick surface if you're not using Teflon, um, it does make it easier. I don't think any of you at home are actually going to be seasoning a pan in high heat and then polishing it so the egg won't stick. So it being in Teflon is definitely one of the things that you will utilize and make sure it's a good non-stick pan when you are cooking it home. Anyway, so I like getting those pans hot ahead of time. You can see on my back stove over there, I already have that pan on. Getting my heat up to temp here and let me just now say, what are the characteristics of a traditional French omelet? Other than what you just saw, that other omelet might have had color and it was just folded over. Well, a traditional French omelet should be creamy. Now, I know some people do not like that runny egg, but then I also know that some people do. A traditional French omelet is creamy. It should be tri-rolled or rolled off of a plate. It should be fluffy. You should incorporate air into it. And then last but not least, it should have zero color. It should be smooth and yellow, nothing else. So I have this nice hot pan. I can tell, and sometimes if your pan starts to smoke, just take it off, wave it around a little bit. You don't want it too hot, but you do want it warm. Most people think you don't want a pan that hot when cooking an omelet. That's not necessarily true, as long as you do it right. Because the other thing about a French omelet, it only takes 20 seconds to make. So right here, I'm going to take this, pour that in there, get that heat high. Now I take this and I scramble. You want to move your pan around and 
make it almost like scrambled eggs. Smooth it out, make sure it's nice and creamy, and that's it. That is all the omelet is. That's sandwich. Let me first show you the roll. So you can see the texture inside is creamy, not running out, just creamy. And then what we do is we roll the omelet on the plate by taking it, take it, roll it, tap it out, just like this, roll it out. You can see the color, nice and yellow. No color at all, nice and fluffy. And yet, when I cut into it, you can see inside that nice creamy nature. Not running out of the pan, but it's in there to give it a little more texture and moisture. I'm going to do this again, but this time when I do it, I'm going to do it and stuff it, which is what my mission was here today. So now, I'm going to get this pan really hot and show you how fast we really can do this. And as I do it, I'm going to stuff it with those grab locks we already previously made, and I'm going to actually add into it a little bit of herb chef to complete the dish. So right now I got that pan nice and hot. I'm gonna add my butter right in there. Right there, I can see it's bubbling, but I want that pan hot. I want the reaction of the egg the second it hits that pan to start to cook so I can incorporate the air and fluff. So right here, I have it right there, nice and hot. I might even have a little bit too much. I love butter. I really love that. Right here. Right in. Get that nice and hot. Scrap. Right like. With that, I'm going to take this. That is all that the omelet is. How I'm going to go about this next phase, I'm actually going to take some of this grab lock and just lay it right in. Just like this. Then, a little chef, just to roll into it with it. The chef is so soft. It's going to melt directly into the omelet the second this rolls. So you only need to put it around three or four little pieces, just like that, so it'll roll nice and even. One other thing I'm going to add, because I love my dill, I'm going to add just a little fresh and just a little. But because of the goat cheese and the grab blocks, the dill inside the omelet will be delicious. And then, take this. And once again, I'm going to roll it just like that. Now, sometimes things will roll out, so you want to be careful how you roll it onto your plate. Make sure it's nice and tight. A little bit coming out might be nice in the presentation because of that beautiful color. You just want to make sure you come out, it goes out like that. So there you go. You can see your omelet. You have that nice, and if you notice, you have that beautiful color yellow. You have a little bit of grab lots coming out. You can already see over here the chef is starting to melt. It'll add a nice creaminess inside that omelet. So right there, after a nice little white on the rim, you have a beautiful French style omelet stuffed with goat cheese, chef, uh, chef. stuffed with chef. Okay. What was that? Okay, okay. Let me say that again. Oh yeah. So now you have this beautiful omelet that is stuffed with gravlox, chev, and dill, which would make a wonderful accompaniment, accompaniment to any meal inside uh, of a brunch. So finally today, the last thing we're gonna do is every kid's favorite, a little taste of pancakes. And I'm gonna put just a gentle twist into a traditional pancake, and I'm going to do it with almost a Japanese style in mind. What does that mean? Well, if you've ever had a Belgian omelet or even a souffle, 
These items use egg whites to actually increase the volume and the rise to what we're making. So today we're going to actually whip our egg whites separately when we make this pancake batter because I do know some people at home always wonder how can you ensure a nice light fluffy pancake. I'm going to show you how you do that and we're going to make it as easy as possible. Once again, when you look online, you have a million recipes for pancakes. Some of you might be a fan of Martha Stewart's. You can take any recipe you find online to do this. The one trick you're going to do is you're not going to use the egg whites inside the recipe. So, like every other recipe you would see for pancakes, what we do, we're going to take our dry ingredients. In this situation, what do we have? We have right here, flour baking powder, 10x sugar, and a little salt. And all of that is going to go inside a dry bowl. Then I'm going to have another bowl we're going to use where we have all of our wet ingredients. Right here, I'm going to use our milk. We're going to have a little vanilla extract for a nice little flavor, and two eggs, but just the yolks. And now all of these ingredients, how we do this, we're gonna use our mixer. I'm gonna use a spatula instead of a wooden spoon. A wooden spoon will work perfectly too. And I'm actually going to take my wet ingredients and add them to my dry. Always try to go wet to dry when mixing ingredients, especially a pancake batter. And then people at home always wonder, well, what about the lumps? Shouldn't we filter this? Shouldn't we get those lumps out? And the answer is no. You want those lumps. Those lumps are gonna help you build a beautiful fluffy pancake as it cooks down. So right here I have my batter but without the egg whites. So what I'm now going to do is behind me, I'm going to take right here, I'm going to take right here my mixer and the egg whites of the two eggs, pour them right in here, and I'm going to add a hint of crema tartare. Crema tartare is gonna act right now as a stabilizer. And when I say a stabilizer, that stabilizer is going to ensure that my egg whites, when they hit a firm peak, that those eggs are gonna stay that firm peak so I can actually fold the fluffy egg whites into this batter. This tends to take around one minute, minute and a half, for me to get it to where I want it achieved. In the meantime, I want you to always know you should have your pan nice and hot, ready to go for your pancakes. Yes, you could use a little butter. As you can see, I'm wiping the butter all around this pan to give it a nice, clean surface that doesn't have too much fat on it, but just enough fat coating all around. We're probably around 20 seconds more away from having that. And then what we're going to do, I can already see my baking powder starting to react here inside my dough. You can start seeing your bubbles start to pop. And right there. My egg whites look beautiful. As you can see, a nice fluffy piece. I'm going to take these, and in thirds, I'm going to take this batter, uh, these egg whites, and fold them into my batter. Now, when I say fold, I don't mean I'm stirring them up like I mixed the first part of this batter. I'm literally folding them in gently so they don't fall. As a result of this, I'm increasing the volume of my batter. Increasing that volume, you're going to also see that that plays a part, and when you batter touches that pan, that it actually will give me more volume as it bakes. And you see that pancake get really, really fluffy. So now I'm gonna get the rest of this in here. Right 
there. As you can see inside, we just fold, fold all around. And the volume of this batter is getting really, really fluffy. So let's we'll get this in. It looks more like a Belgian waffle batter now than it does a pancake. But it's going to be like a pancake. As you all know, a waffle has to go inside a griddle or inside the iron itself. And that's what shapes it. But right here, instead of shaping these, and you could shape them if you wanted to. And in some traditional methods, you could use a mold to actually shape these in the pan. By using a little food spray, you can mold it. But I know a lot of people at home do not have these molds. so. To show you today, I'm only going to put it directly in using the large spoon. You can see the height it's going to give to me. Two of these right here. The other three small ones. Just like that. One thing I'd like to tell you at home, always watch over your heat. If you have a griddle to do these on, I know you can regulate that heat and the machine itself will do it. I have this set between a six and a seven on this stove top. When you're doing that, you have to regulate how much heat is there so you get that nice caramelization on the outside. Just like a regular pancake, you look for the bubbles as they develop on top of the pancake to actually know where you are and how far along inside of it is. You never want to flip that pancake until you know you're almost halfway up with steam cooking the inside of it. You can tell right in here I'm already having bubbles build up. So at that stage, I know I can actually come over here and I'm going to use this. Ready a little flip. A little flip. Let's see where we're at. That looks good. You can tell already by this that the fluff is already that thick. So you get this nice, airy, light, fluffy pancake that could be served with so many things. I love doing compound butters, like brown sugar, maple, salty compound butter to go on top of it. But then just more maple syrup goes a long way when it comes to a pancake. And when that comes down, let's see what the organization is underneath here. We're almost there. So I'll take this. I have more melted butter there. I'm just going to take these. Let's see. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Just like that, we have nice and fluffy pancakes. Maybe a little drizzle, butter on top. And voila, you have pancakes. And voila, you have pancakes. A Japanese variety, nice and fluffy. You got it. Hold on one second. Because what is most important to me now is making sure this. I might. Yeah. I hate to say it, I might have. Yeah. To. I mean, but let me let me see. If this yeah. works, it works. You know what I mean? Let's just see. I'm very flexible. <laughs> <laughs> The 
gotta do this, otherwise it will stick. The one thing I don't like is too much of that in there. Take it out. There you go. Put that back in. Give it a drizzle of real butter instead of that other stuff. That was more or less just for the the sides. Stop. Try it. Like a pancake. Try it. Very airy. That's yeah. That's wow. the whole goal. The whole goal. And then, I know you're getting footage right now with it, so. That's how this one can be. Very good. The whole trick here is getting the yolk right in that middle. Do a free form 